Live from Cambridge, Massachusetts, it's The Cube at the MIT Chief Data Officer and Information Quality Symposium. With hosts Dave Vellante and Paul Gillen. Welcome back to Cambridge, Massachusetts, everybody. This is Dave Vellante, I'm here with Paul Gillen. This is theCUBE, theCUBE is Silicon Angle's live mobile studio. We go out to the events, we extract the signal from the noise. This is the second year we've done the MIT Information Quality Symposium and the Chief Data Officer Forum. Joe McGuire is here. He is a consultant, he's with uh, Data Quality Strategies, a former Gartner and Burton Group analyst, former software guy, um, worked for large companies. Joe, welcome to theCUBE. It's great to be here, thanks for having me. So is this your first year at the uh, MIT event, or were you here no, last no, year? No, no, it's, uh, someone was saying earlier in, in one of the uh, introductory uh, set of remarks that this conference is in its eighth year, right. which um, was a surprise to me because I've um, been here for nine. Been here <laughs> for what seems like 20. That's right. That's right. Well, you stepped on the punchline. Um, I've been doing this for, uh, involved with this conference for six years. I started give, uh, just as a, as a presenter of some ideas, and after a couple of years of that, I got roped into uh, intensified activity, and now I'm on the committee that uh, organizes the program. Oh, excellent. So we didn't have a chance to meet last year, so I'm glad, I'm glad we, can, we, we can, and thanks for coming on theCUBE on, on short notice. So, what is the state of, of data quality? You've been in this business for a long time. We were talking earlier, showing our age, about the, the old days of case, and right. so you've seen the cycle. Um, where, where have we come, and, and where are we, and what does all this big well, data stuff mean? I, I think that the state of, the, the state of data quality, it's hard, there's, there's no simple answer for that, there's no one answer for that, because there are different kinds of data, and there are um, uh, some forms of data that have really um, enjoyed a lot, of it, a lot of attention. The data quality specialists, the data quality researchers, and the data quality vendors have lavished attention on certain forms of data. Most notably, the kinds of data that, that might exist in a relational database. And the, uh, consequently, the current state of the art in data quality uh, is skewed towards ensuring the quality of relational data. So a lot of the techniques involve uh, co confirming that referential integrity constraints are met and there are certain uh, relational query based techniques for, for scanning through data and making sure that it's high quality. For some other forms of data, a lot of which is what, which a lot of big data is about, it's much harder to even define what constitutes quality. When you have uh, free-flowing text and paragraphs, it's hard to even recognize um, whether a piece of data is high quality or not. And one of the ways that uh, folks sort of cope with that and try and bring some of the expertise of data quality techniques that apply to structured data onto unstructured data is to superimpose on unstructured data metadata, which is structured, and apply data quality techniques to that metadata. But example still is very be, difficult. An example might be tagging, right? Tagging is one way to sort of decorate data, but just you know, in a JPEG format, there's a, there's a header, and the header in a JPEG file will have a lot of, um, will have, has got some metadata in it, and that structured and that kind of data could be extracted out and put into a relational database. And so that kind of data is amenable to these data quality techniques that were designed for structured data. Now certainly so, over the last few years, since, since data quality, and I, 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 uh, MIT has been, has, been, has been advocating for information quality for over, over 20 years, uh, through a formal program, we, we've seen the way data quality is collected has changed. Much more of it is collected by machine now, it's collected automatically from devices rather than entered by humans. How has that changed some of the issues that you face with data quality problems at the customers you work with? Well, there's a couple of issues there. One of them is uh, the issue of data that's collected by machines versus data that's collected by humans. And the other is the issue of um, data that's collected perhaps by some organization or some bot that is not under the purview of your particular enterprise. Uh, you know, data from the Twitter feed or whatever. So I'll tackle those, those questions in order. The, the, the issue about whether data is collected by humans or by machines is that humans quite naturally make mistakes. And humans can cope, ha have mechanisms to cope with the mistakes that they make. And our software systems are sometimes uh, dismissive of the essential nature of this data whose ultimate source is human beings. And we ought to be 
designing systems that, and designing policies and processes that expect to encounter bad data. And one way to, you know, to um, cope with the human realities of poor data is to make sure that we make systems that aren't so brittle that they yield dreadful, dreadful results when the data is bad because we know that the data is going to be bad. Um, uh, and a, a, an example that I can, or a little story I'll tell you about, about that has to do with um, a credit card company that uses the, the presence of pristine, perfect, 100% defect-free data in certain contexts as a sign that something is wrong. Because data shouldn't be perfect and 100% pristine if it's coming from humans. Talk humans about are paranoid. <laughs> yeah, humans are going to make mistakes. Sometimes they're not even mistakes. They're just inconsistencies about one day I'll spell out my address S-T-R-E-E-T -E -E and the next day I'll spell it out, I'll abbreviate it, S-T. And that sounds like, you know, that, that's, if all the data that's coming in from a particular point of service for a credit card company has all the addresses perfectly normalized, exactly as the post it's office would want to see fraudulent. them, that's a sign of yeah. fraud. Mm -hmm. And what an organization ought to do is develop an appreciation for just how dirty the data ought to be if you know that there's a human source for it and be prepared to respond accordingly if the data deviates from that level of dirtiness in either direction. Because if it gets too clean, you should smell a rat. So, so, so Joe, I want to clarify something you said earlier. So as we move from sort of the systems of record to systems of engagement, there's a lot of people like to say, you're saying a lot of organizations are sort of creating a metadata layer uh, and applying it to that unstructured data. Are you saying that's a, that is a viable approach? That's a best practice or that's... That's, that's certainly a viable approach and it, and it is a way to get some semblance of, or, or, to, or to, to harvest what we know about techniques for data quality and structured data and, and applying it in some way to the problem of unstructured data. There are all kinds of other uh, techniques that can make sense. I mean, the, the unstructured data, the payload of, un, of an unstructured data uh, file is the unstructured data. It's not the metadata. The metadata is, is interesting, but the payload is the paragraph or the tweet. Uh, and companies are looking to find out, do things like sentiment analysis on um, the payload. They may, they may be looking for uh, words of disenchantment, you know, stinks, dislike, sucks, very near their brand or their company name. And to, to do that kind of analysis, you need to look at the data payload itself. You need to look at the unstructured data. And so the techniques for making sure that that data is high quality or detecting uh, are less mature than the techniques for ensuring quality data in structured environment. And in particular, there are difficulties with um, detecting sarcasm, detecting irony. Uh, and it's so, a hard problem. I mean, it, I'm sure it, the NSA is trying to solve that problem, the, right? The, the, yeah, the, the major bit of, uh, bit of advice that I, that I would have for, for organizations that are buying text analytics, piece of text analytics software, is to um, reach out to a linguist. The, uh, these text analytics tools are very powerful and you can do all kinds of cool things but you may not know what you're doing. <laughs> you may not know how language works well enough to really understand this, uh, and understand the results that these tools are giving you. Uh, an analogy from 20, 25 years ago is when products like SPSS and uh, that statistical package for the social sciences came out. It was sort of statistics for the masses, and, and the initial reaction response was, oh, this is great, now I can do statistics. And people were using those products, although they didn't know statistics, and they eventually figured out pretty fast, <laughs> those I don't really understand what a, what a p-value <laughs> is, and I guess I need to hire a statistician. <laughs> well, I, I see some of the same stuff happening now, and you need to hire a, a linguist, because you may think that a frequent use of personal pronouns is a sign of narcissism, and so you can analyze the speeches of presidents and decide who's a narcissist and who's not. But you really need to understand how pronouns work. You really need to understand whether or not there's a link between uh, pronouns and narcissism. And then you probably need to understand whether or not there's a link between narcissism and effectiveness as a precedent too. So there's a lot of people who think they understand about language and they're very eager to use these text analytics products. And we need the expertise that's not technological expertise about bits and bytes. It's technological, it's technical expertise about language to uh, really get our money's worth out of these products. I, I, think, I think what you're talking about is good data but bad analysis. 
where, where the data itself may be true, but it's badly collected, badly interpreted, massaged, presented. And I think of all of the research that's available on the internet now. Anybody, any, any idiot with a SurveyMonkey account can, can generate a research report. And so mm -hmm. you can find research that will justify almost anything you want to believe. Does your work, do you see this as an increasing part of the data quality problem, where the data itself may be accurate, it may be, tr it may be accurate, but it's not true? Well, I think that it is a malign effect, or a potentially malign effect of the big data world, in that people can say basically, um, well, I've got my conclusions, now I'm going to go find the data to support it. And there's enough data out there in the blogosphere, in the Twitter feed, in whatever, whatever uh, tech, text data you may be collecting if you're the NSA or whatever, to find the, uh, the result that you want. So yeah, I think that's, that's a problem. I think that big data presents some other uh, other unique problems to data quality um, that don't have to do necessarily with um, structured data versus unstructured data. One of the biggest of which is just a lot of the big data you're analyzing, you don't own. And so it doesn't fall under the purview of your data quality initiatives and your data quality programs. So you have to live with the quality of data that you get. So Nate Silver was on theCUBE last year at the Tableau user conference in, mm -hmm. in DC. And we were probing, Jeff Kelly and I were probing him about the data quality issue on, on Twitter in particular, uh, but social media generally. And, and Jeff just walked in, you might remember this, we're talking, to Nate, we're talking about Nate, Nate Silver. And Nate essentially put forth the premise that the data is not there. It doesn't exist, it's, all, it's, it's, it's crap as it is today. Now it may evolve to get better. Do you buy that or do you believe it's a fundamental data quality issue? Nate Silver was saying that the data is not the, there to the, be analyzed the, 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 at all. The, 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 the base data is not good enough to draw inference from, um, yet it's not mature enough, uh, that it's not solvable with better data quality practices or better engines or whatever it is, the data just sucks. Um, and we sort of debated that, because I'm not sure I buy it. But I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that, no? I, that I would go that far, but I would say that the best data quality practices that we have for unstructured data um, aren't good enough to solve the data quality problems that do exist in unstructured. Okay, so the, but, but that's a different conclusion, I mean, it's, right? It's, so such, it's, it's a much harder problem than data quality for, for structured data. Because by its very nature, structured data, you struggle to understand what the data means beforehand. Right, you've, you've done you a lot of heavy your, lifting. You design your data model right. for a database before you ever create a single row. Right, versus a schemaless yeah. environment. But it's also a, a fun, function, I presume, of what kind of what, what question you're trying to answer? Who's ready to buy? Yes. Who's a threat? <coughs> yes, that's true. Do you um, see any technologies that are that are promising in this area? Uh, any any potential great leaps forward in being able to understand unstructured data better? Um, I think that what uh, the data tamer well, I guess they've changed their name to Tamer. Um, what they're up to uh, is a, is a big help. Um, and can, but I haven't been that? following that space that? that space super super closely. It's a it's a technique. I just had to leave the presentation that that uh, that uh, Data Tamer was giving here in order to come and speak with you oh, nice fellows. We apologize. We apologize uh, right, <laughs> so I know half of a presentation <laughs> as much as I should about it. Um, but it's it's a technique for it's a it's a tool for um, curation of structured and un unstructured data at big data at big data scale. Um, so one of the uh, big problems, I think that problem is, is um, we have simpler problems we haven't solved yet, actually. And one of them has to do with this, this word schemaless that you used. And in a, in a, in a large part of uh, big data technology is about schemaless implementations. And you have you know, things that are based on um, Google's, big, Google's big table, which is a very loose sort of schema. And, Folks are using schemaless implementations because there are technological reasons why it, why it might be advantageous in their organization to do that. But a schemaless implementation um, does not necessarily mean that the phenomenon that you are automating is a schemaless phenomenon. And there's a serious risk here that if the phenomenon itself, from the user's perspective, from your from your clients or the data constituents' perspective, perspective, is a schema-rich phenomenon, then you should model it. And the fact that you are producing a, a, tech, a technological solution that doesn't require much of a model does not obviate the need for you to model the, the phenomenon so that you understand it. And one of the uh, ugly truths about how folks have been doing uh, 
system design for the past 20 years is that they do all of their modeling in a relational context. Conceptual modeling, business level modeling, they do all of that modeling in, while they're doing logical relational modeling. And now that you have a schemaless context, you say, we're not using a relational technique. We don't have to do that relational modeling anymore. You're effectively throwing, throwing out the baby with the bathwater and not doing any business modeling. I, I, I think that's really insightful, Joe. I'll tell you a quick little uh, tangent here. Uh, Squirrel, one of the companies here in Cambridge, their CTO, Adam Fuchs, mm -hmm. um, basically has talked about, so Squirrel basically spun out of the NSA. They, they, the NSA built the prism, which is, it was a big table mimic. And Adam talked about how essentially they took the schemaless environment and, and, and put structure to it. And it was critical in terms of being able to actually get the data out of it that they wanted, being able to layer a model on top of that mm -hmm. schema. So, in, in practice, I mean, the NSA is doing it, you know, it's causing a lot of fervor, but clearly it's been an effective in some way, shape, or form. Um, so that's an example, I guess, to answer mm -hmm. one of Paul's questions. The other thing I'd, I'd, I'd observe, in this world of, of data governance, you mentioned tagging before, Paul, um, and I, I don't know if you meant by that human tagging or some kind of automated tagging. No, well, it could be either, but, but the, idea of, the idea of structuring unstructured data through metadata, I would think of that as being one, an example of how you would do that. Yes. Yeah, and, and there have been efforts to classify, auto-classify data, um, mm -hmm. uh, but it seems like the industry has just defaulted to using search as a, as a brute force instrument. Uh, uh, Google Plus, for example, auto-tags comments, uh, posts in Google Plus so they're applying some level of automation to unstructured data. Which you have to do to scale, presumably, yeah, you right? you have to do to scale. Yeah, and, and so, so tagging and entity extraction are, are, are legitimate ways to decorate, <coughs> excuse me, to decorate unstructured data with uh, some semblance of structure so you can tease out uh, anytime you see Mr. or Dr. then you can, or Mrs. or Ms. that you can see um, Oh, okay, this is the name of a person. Anytime you see street, you can sort of format things in an address, and then you can link up those addresses into uh, addresses that are articulated elsewhere, perhaps in a, in a structured uh, context, in a structured database. And there are mathematical, you know, well-known mathematical concepts to, to, to classify data, certainly. Yeah. Support vector machines, probabilistic latent semantic indexing, and things like that that people have used for years that with varying degrees of effectiveness, by yeah, the way. <laughs> one of the th when, when people talk about information classification, um, you know, sort of one, of the, one of the typical uh, applications of that is if you're a company and you are involved in some kind of lawsuit about a particular product yeah. of yours, you have to go through all of your documents, <clears throat> excuse me, all of your documents, and classify them as, yes, this document is germane to our, to our research and development about this product, and this one isn't. And information classification is thought of as this thing that you do in response to a particular situation, a lawsuit. Uh, but information classification can work, uh, that you can do it on all your documents, and you need to, to classify things like this is uh, data that is, uh, falls under the purview of the HIPAA Act, this is uh, personally identifying information, this is financial information, this is uh, company confidential information, this is intellectual property. And that kind of information classification ought to happen both on your unstructured data and your structured data. Because you can certainly look at a database right. column and say, this is HIPAA. Well, you know, This from, is personally identifying information. This is a social security. And from 2006 with the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure to let's say 2009, prior to the big data meme really taking off, that was a general counsel sort of driven initiative. Has, my question is, has the bit flipped where now information quality is focused on the business opportunity as opposed to sort of the mitigating risk information. Well, <laughs> information quality, the, 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 how do you measure how much information quality is there? And uh, there are some sort of nitty gritty technical ways of measuring information quality in, in the highly structured environment. But generally, if the, the information quality and data quality has, has evolved so that we recognize that the way to measure information quality is by measuring the outcomes that it yields. It's so more sort of indirect. So we we had a time, but so we didn't talk about half the stuff we wanted to talk about because we had it was an interesting guest and we went all There's kinds of different directions. So <laughs> we'll give you the last word. Uh, give us the, the the summary of your thoughts on the conference or any other activities that you're working on. What's the uh, this, is, this is a great conference. I like I like being here. I will I will say this. Try and squeeze in one of these bullet items. Yeah, please. Chief data officers who are one of the target uh, target audiences of this conference should recognize that big data is not revolutionary. It's it's important. 
Yeah, they should pay attention to it. But you think about what a revolution is. A revolution is something that, where, where the result of it cannot coexist with whatever came before. And that's just not the case. We don't want to allow big data to induce us to forget all the hard lessons that we learned since the 1970s about data quality, about modeling, about doing careful requirements analysis, about the fact that a single data, data source ought to be able to um, serve many different applications. We don't want to return to the 70s kind of mentality of applications have files. And many of the big data best practices seem to be reminiscent of those bad, bad ideas that we uh, learned lessons about over the past 20 years. So the chief data officer's op uh, uh, job with respect to big data is to recognize big data doesn't change everything. It changes some things and not others. And the chief data officer is responsible for, for differentiating which is which and to establish policies accordingly. So that's my, uh, that's my last piece. Good. Good, uh, good wrap, Joe. Thanks very much for coming to theCUBE. It was a pleasure it's, having you. It's great to be here. Squeeze Thank you, in. you very much. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be back with our next guest. This is theCUBE. We're live from MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and we'll be right back. Yeah, no,